I'll be moderating the next session, which is about Amazon's monopoly power, threats to a fair marketplace. Um, as you can hear in my voice, I didn't put a question mark in that statement, because I think uh, we're beyond uh, that point. I think it's a fact that uh, Amazon has become extremely pow powerful in a wide range of markets. Uh, they're both retailer, they're also the marketing platform on which other, other retailers rely. They have expanded into cloud services, payments, uh, fashion, video producing, TV shows. Um, actually, I could go on for a long time, but let's not do that. But I think the point is clear. Um, they have become extremely powerful, and this creates a manifold uh, conflict of interest. There's questions around the data that they use. And um, I think it's very timely that we have this debate right now, because of course, both at the European level, at the Commission, is looking into Amazon's practices, but also in the US uh, this has begun. I also understood that um, right now in the US uh, there's been a coalition uh, being mobilized, Athena, uh, to kind of uh, you know question and, and agitate against uh, against that power. Um, I'm very happy to discuss today here like, the problems that this market power of Amazon creates, and also perhaps uh, to discuss some solutions. And I'm thrilled to have with us uh, our very esteemed panelists. First, we have with us uh, Stacey Mitchell. She's co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. She's been tracking and documenting Amazon's practices for years. And you also already came out with a report. This was already years ago, actually, when you already saw what was happening. 2016, it was called Amazon's Stranglehold. So I can recommend you read that, uh, because it's still up to date, actually. It also points perhaps a bit to the problematic uh, stasis when it comes to policy responses, but that's another, that's another uh, discussion perhaps. Um, we have with us um, Meryl Hall. She's the Managing Director of the Booksellers Association, fighting for booksellers uh, for High Street in the UK and Ireland, but also of course today here for Europe as a whole, thank you. Uh, so we really have to have you here. Uh, and last but not least, we have with us Thomas Hübner, I hope I pronounce it correctly. Uh, he's a partner at law firm uh, Hausfeld. He's also a professor for business law at Berlin University. Uh, and he's also been uh, involved personally, well, personally, but uh, in, in uh, his professional capacity, obviously, um, in representing uh, complainants uh, against uh, Amazon's practices. So extremely relevant experience as well. Uh, on that note, I would like um, to kick off with uh, Stacey Mitchell. Perhaps if you could explain a little bit uh, what you see are the key uh, the problems uh, with, with Amazon's market power from your perspective. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, and I'm, I'm just so glad to see this symposium come together, the first global symposium on checking Amazon's power. Um, I work at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're a nonprofit uh, research and policy advocacy organization, and we're deeply concerned about monopoly power, and particularly about the loss of local economic agency that comes when communities lose local, uh, small, and mid-sized businesses uh, to these growing uh, monopolies. I think uh, you know, Justin sort of rattled off a whole bunch of things that Amazon is doing, all of these different areas of the economy where its tentacles are, are reaching. And it can be sort of hard to grasp what Amazon is because it is so many different things. Um, and I think it's really helpful as we think about uh, what we need to do to bring this company in to have a really clear understanding of, of what it's about. Um, whether it's, it's what it's doing in retail or in healthcare, Amazon really has set out to own and control the underlying infrastructure of the economy. To be the, the platform, the railroad, if you will, that all commerce rides on. So we have the retail platform in the US, where it's more than half of all shopping searches now start on Amazon. And that means if you're a company that bakes or retails any consumer product, you have basically no choice but to be on Amazon's platform if you want to reach the online market. Its control of the cloud uh, means that lots of other companies, from Condé Nast, the publisher, to Netflix, to the Central Intelligence Agency in the US, rely on Amazon's cloud infrastructure to manage their data. Um, and Alexa, its voice interface, is the dominant uh, voice platform out there. We now have thousands of, of products, appliances, devices, cars, that are Alexa-enabled. And the idea for Amazon is that Alexa is going to be everywhere, always listening. 
this immersive environment, able to identify you by your voice. And what this means is that Alexa will become the interface for all of these other companies that want to produce internet-connected devices. And it will also increasingly become the interface that we're using in order to access the web. Um, all of this really points to like the structural power that Amazon has. This is very distinct from monopolies that dominate a particular market. Uh, this is a company that, that controls the underlying infrastructure. Um, and, and that enables it to do two things. One is it gives Amazon this godlike view of everything that is happening across all of these sectors of the economy. And it can use that information to move into new markets with a built-in advantage because it already knows how those markets operate. It can see what other companies are doing in those markets. Um, and the other thing that it does is that it allows Amazon to use its position as a gatekeeper to selectively privilege its own products and services, give them top ranking, easier access in the search results. Um, and for everything that it doesn't want to deal with, it'll let other companies handle that, but then charge effectively a tax on their trade, a tax that other companies cannot you know, do anything about but pay. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful and incredibly lucrative um, place to be. And so I think we have to understand the threat that Amazon poses to democracy as, as fundamental. You know, in, in a democracy, a market is, a, is an open place governed by public rules. And what we were seeing with Amazon is that we no longer even have markets. We have marketplaces. We have a, a private arena in which the rules are set by a single company that has the ability to set the terms for all of the other participants in that market, to tax their activity, to regulate their activity, and indeed to punish them if it doesn't like what they do. And what we see for the sellers, the independent, small, uh, and mid-sized businesses that are dependent on Amazon <coughs> platform, they can be suspended overnight and see their businesses killed. They are seeing increasing fees year after year. They're giving over more and more of their revenue to Amazon. Uh, all of this arbitrary uh, uh, behavior. The last couple of things I want to say, um, I guess a second, it's, it's important to understand Amazon not as, a, as you know, simply a product of, of someone's genius and innovation, but really Amazon is very much a product of deliberate public policy choices. In the US, at least, we you know, suspended effectively our antitrust laws in the 1970s, and the result is that Amazon was able to, to grow and to take over this kind of control using tactics that would have been prohibited uh, even just a few years before it started. Uh, Amazon has also benefited enormously from tax breaks and subsidies. Amazon grew without having to collect the kind of taxes that every competitor uh, to, to Amazon had to collect. Uh, the subsidies, the way that it pits cities against each other. Amazon exists because of deliberate policy choices. And if we made different kinds of policy choices, we would have a different world, a more open and more competitive uh, kind of economy. And the last thing I want to say is I think that um, what's interesting about this moment that we're in is that there, because of this recognition of the power of, of, of the problem of monopoly power, and particularly of the kind of structural power that the tech companies have, we are seeing new coalitions form that really center issues of power. And so we're beginning to see labor and small business come together. I think that's quite interesting in terms of being able to challenge the centralization of power and to articulate a different vision of an economy where power is dispersed. Um, whether you work for a living or sell your wares for a living, that you need to have uh, a, a, a voice and, and, and a fair amount of power in the economy that you operate in. Uh, as Justin mentioned, we've got a new coalition that's come together in the US, Athena, which is a coalition of uh, more than 40 civil society organizations representing uh, labor, racial justice organizations, community groups, small business organizations. It's quite a breadth, um, and all centering around this idea that we have to break Amazon's power, that we have to restructure this company to operate in the public interest, and we, that is a necessary ingredient to addressing its abuses uh, across all these different areas. So thanks. That was a um, very good overview of, of the issues and also a lot of the point that you made, made about uh, the fact that these are the consequences of policy choices. Like very often we talk about tech and digital stuff. The 
features present as unalterable, as you know, this is this is the technology, this is what's happening, and it's just the most efficient, we can't change it. But almost all of the cases, we can talk about Google, Uber, Amazon, it's about specifically ducking regulation and using that to create competitive advantage, which shouldn't be a competitive advantage. So I think that's really an important point. Um, Errol, you would like to talk a little bit about the uh, the impact also on booksellers uh, in high street and associations. Thank you. Okay, so the Booksellers Association is uh, an association of booksellers, as it says on the chip. Uh, we've been around since 1895, so we've got a bit of a uh, previous record. We have about 900, excuse me, 900 members representing about 5,000 outlets. Uh, and we represent bookshops of all sizes and, sh and shapes. We see our role very much as fighting for bookshops, and we've adopted that assertive language quite deliberately. Um, we also work in global alliances with other organisations. We're members of the European and International Booksellers Federation, who are here today. Um, and we're very proactive in creating submissions for any investigations, whether by the UK government, they did an investigation into business rates, which is a very vexatious to pick up more in the UK, or by or uh, by DG Competition at the EU, to whom we submitted a substantial submission in 2014 about Amazon's dominance of the ebook market. Um, and obviously we will be participating in the antitrust investigation into Amazon Marketplace also. Books, of course, were the first thing that Amazon sold. Um, they're small, they're easily transported, they're low value, and they also have a very sophisticated and effective supply chain. And crucially for online retailing, we have um, a robust classification system, which is the ISBN, which is the little barcode on the back of every book, which has all the data, its price and uh, bibliographic data that you need to sell the book. So it's a little wonder, really, that Jeff Bezos started with us, and he hasn't let up yet. Um, the UK was also fertile ground for Amazon, given that their entry into the industry coincided with the dismantling of our own resale price maintenance legislation in 1997, which was the net book agreement. And that unleashed an era of ruinous price uh, discounting and set off really 22 years of uh, bookshop decline. Since 1995, we've lost over a thousand bookshops in the UK and Ireland. Uh, then we had 1,894, and today we have 880, which is still better than a lot of independent sectors, uh, but it's you know it's less than half what we used to have. There has been a recent very slight recovery, uh, but that has come at a tremendous cost, and I do get slightly annoyed when legislators and the media say to us, now, oh, bookshops are recovering. We had a net increase of 15 last year, but you think that's the tremendous cost. Um, not only of individual bookshops and livelihoods and employers and literal shop windows for books, but the cultural and society loss, societal loss that that represents. A colleague recently posed this question on Twitter, which is the new um, high street really, isn't it? Uh, what would the book treat be like if Amazon didn't exist? And it's quite an interesting question to ask yourself. And it gave me pause for thought. The problem isn't so much that Amazon exists, though. It's what Amazon has been allowed by investors, the government regulators, and by consumers to become. That's the problem. A super efficient, cost-effective, comprehensive, easy to navigate, and easy to access online retail that clearly delivers consumer value, especially to those who live far from shops and are looking to source hard-to-find items. The problem is that it's all got out of hand, as we all know very well in this room. Examples are legion, of course, from small boxes of single items being driven up and down motorways and diesel vans, and the warehouses that are constructed to feed the increased demand from consumers are employing people who are poor, poorly paid and badly treated. Um, now, some of what might have ha what happened to the UK to our market could have happened regardless. Discounting was becoming um, established by the late 1990s, and a lot of bookshops were, frankly, not very good and a lot of those not really good bookshops went by the wayside. Um, so I'm not pretending that we were perfect, uh, we're absolutely not, but the insult to injury that Amazon represented has made it a bit, bitter pill to swallow to see the book selling sector hollowed out as it has been. And I'd just I'd quickly summarise a few things um, on real life impacts, as Justin has asked me to do, that Amazon's had on the UK book industry in a few broad brush strokes. The first is high streets, and in Ireland I have to call them Main Street, you know, they'd call them High Streets in Ireland, so, um, if there are any Irish people, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so the British High Street is now the graveyard of many one tribute retailers, and the government has finally started to notice. They didn't really notice when it was bookshop chains and independents going out of business, but they do notice now. And a key talking point has become the inequity in our business taxation system. One of the crippling occupancy costs for retailers is business rates, which is related to property value rather than to profit. And therefore, out-of-town warehouses, the like of which Amazon operates, 
which I only think virtual department stores and our running retail businesses pay a fraction of what high street retailers pay. And this has finally created a loud outcry about the unfairness at the heart of UK business taxation. The second point I want to just focus on is e-books. Um, e-books were the great book trade innovation in the last decade and Amazon invested heavily and credit to them to some extent for doing that. They developed the Kindle, a proprietary system to sell their own products only and locked consumers into that ecosystem. They attempted to slash prices on e-books and despite valiant rear-guard action by publishers, they have succeeded in mopping up a nearly 90% of the e-book market. Bookshops tried to compete, partnering with a few other providers in the market, but there is no real foothold for conventional booksellers in this space, and there's almost no e-book market for anyone else anymore, and Amazon are entirely dominant. Audiobooks is the new Wild West in this regard. Uh, bookshops would like very much to be able to sell all for books in all formats to all consumers, but the audiobook market is quickly becoming another area where high street bookshops used to have a share, but now can't get a look in. Audible, which is owned by Amazon, as you'll know, has guzzled up the advantageous audio rights from publishers, and they position themselves as virtually the only place to buy audiobooks. Publishers seem not to mind that their traditional customers, who would have sold substantial volumes of audiobooks on CD, are now entirely locked out, certainly in the independent sector. Marketplace has had a lot of attention already this morning. There's a current EQ investigation going on, and we will be submitting a complaint to that, even though we're just about to leave the EU. I'm sorry about Brexit, by the way. Um, and we're, that's obviously looking at the extent to which Amazon are gaming the system where they simultaneously provide the online platform and exploit others using it. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, unfair practices in our membership of the marketplace. The ecosystem for books really is completely warped. Um, the advantages that Amazon has received from governments in terms of taxation, subsidy and investment have allowed it to become entirely dominant. Publishers are reliant, like all other suppliers, on it to reach consumers and they dare not really criticise its practices. Booksellers have become deft and innovative in their own right, and they are clever and creative retailers very often, but even clever and creative retailers can withstand, can't withstand too many customers showrooming in their shops, or the unseen increase in taxation, which tips them over from being viable to failing. And consumer choice, I mean, this is the thing that Amazon, that's the flag that Amazon fly, is that consumer choice is improved and consumer price is low. But one of the ironies of Amazon dominance is that there's the assumption, which is often very unchallenged, uh, that Amazon is cheap. It's not always true. In fact, we've been talking to our campus booksellers recently, and they will tell tales of students who walk from their residence, passing the campus bookshop to the post office on campus, to pick up the books that they order from Amazon, walking past the bookshop where the book is on sale for a cheaper price. And you've also got the second end of customers to Amazon Prime, so that customers no longer have any choice for Amazon <coughs> during the game of time. So what are we doing about this unfairness and inequality? Well, we're complaining about it all the time. We complain to whoever will listen, we take to stage and page, and we make the point all the time that bookshops and high streets are of crucial importance, not just to uh, commerce, but to economic and cultural well-being. And that's a, a, a point that was made earlier today. We've commissioned our own research to demonstrate the value of books and to the economy, and we help our members, our bookshops, to demonstrate their wider value every day. Um, to their community, their high streets, their customers, and to schools. We accentuate the positives wherever we can, trying not to whinge about what Amazon is doing wrong, but to accept the positive, positives of what we are doing. And there have been some significant wins. The EU fined Amazon 250 million euros for illegal state aid. They cracked in on their most favoured nation clauses in their contracts. And they prevented Amazon from charging 3% of the AT on e-books supplied from Luxembourg to UK customers, rather than the 20% it should have charged. But these are all incredibly intensive and hard to win fights, so um, it's a long battle. Bookshops themselves have become adept at survival. They work on incredibly small margins with the taxation system biased against them and enormous competitive pressures coming from online. But they have created innovative, inspiring places and valued places in communities. They fought against the online giant and to some extent we are turning the tide. Uh, but we will not keep running this fight if the unchecked power of Amazon is not halted. So I'm all for the fight in the reach today. Thank you. So the spirit is there, but it's an uphill struggle, I feel, especially if, when you talked about uh, audiobooks of the new markets uh, being dominated. Uh, some person feels as well. Uh, E-books, um, you also mentioned some small wins, so most of the nation clauses on taxation. I think taxation is crucial, but we all know it's very difficult in Europe. 
Um, but a lot, lots to talk about. Also, your question: How would the book market look like uh, without Amazon? It's kind of an interesting thought experiment. Um, Thomas, let's move over to you. Perhaps you could share uh, also a bit from your experience uh, with uh, with competition law and, and in, in addressing uh, some of the abuses uh, or alleged abuses uh, on behalf of Amazon. Sure. Thank you for the invitation and also for the curious introductory speeches, I think they really set the scene perfectly for me so I can pick up there quite quickly because I already pointed out what the issues are. Now, it is not unusual that in these scenarios, uh, in, in these scenarios, people first turn to competition law to find solutions. The reason being that competition law is the most general provision to deal with threats to, to competition where companies use new measures that haven't been seen before, but they have a very detrimental impact, and people try to analyze that through the broad scope that competition law provides. Unfortunately, there are also some weaknesses of competition law. One of them is that it's always coming ex post, so you first have to wait till basically something has happened, and it may then be too late to intervene, and these proceedings take quite some time. However, when it comes to Amazon, we've seen a few investigations now. Some have been mentioned earlier on, dealing with ebooks in particular, because it was the first sector where Amazon was very strong and the first issues really materialized. The most recent one at European level being an investigation into Amazon's use of data that Amazon gathers through the marketplace. The Amazon marketplace is, of course, a very powerful tool for. Amazon to bundle merchants to its own websites to provide them a distribution channel and many merchants love that of course because it enables them to sell goods without having to reach the audience themselves. They don't need a powerful website, they just need to provide their goods and, and that's about it. And the promise that Amazon was making was we are just spreading the reach and broadening the scope uh, and, and the audience that you can reach and, and there are only advantages for you. It turns out that Amazon of course is in there for its own revenues and what is currently investigated is whether Amazon is using the data it collects through the marketplace regarding which products of its merchants that sell goods through the marketplace do well at which prices and by observing that they take away the risk of basically being the pioneer in the market and then selling a new goods that then doesn't fly. So Amazon can be the second mover that is then much more successful than the first mover because they can you know, focus just on the products that do very well and then just outbeat them by cutting the price, you know, approaching either the manufacturer directly or copying the product and, and producing it themselves. And that is a very strong risk because it may take away the incentives for many companies to, to produce new and innovative products in the first place. So that's something that is still investigated. We don't quite know yet but where it is heading. There are different theories of harm connected to that investigation. One is the simple leveraging, basically, that Amazon uses its dominant position as a marketplace to enhance its position in the sale of its own goods. Um, through using the data that it collects. Um, but there are some other theories that are connected to that gathering and use of data. An investigation that has been brought to an end, however, very recently, that's why I want to focus on that, um, is the German probe into uh, Amazon's terms and conditions. The background is Germany is the second largest marketplace for Amazon, the second largest market. Uh, globally. There have been over a hundred complaints of merchants against Amazon before the German Federal Cartel Authority, mostly dealing with the terms and conditions that Amazon unilaterally imposes on them. You either have to take them or you leave them and use their system. And many of those terms and conditions were considered to be abusive because in the competitive situations no one would ever sign them. So the authority focused on that, started in November 2018, and in a record time of 
this eight month, they found an agreement with Amazon. The agreement set in July 2019, so very recent, basically contains that some liability clauses that previously basically relieved Amazon of any liability towards merchants were softened, so there's more of a mutual liability. Other aspect where transparency clauses, basically many complained that Amazon just closes their accounts or throws them off the marketplace without any obvious reasons. The merchants didn't really know what they have done wrong and it took forever to be you know, approved again to come to the uh, platform. And for many of those that meant you know, a real threat to their business because the biggest distribution channel all of a sudden closed down. So Amazon obliged itself that if they want to close an account, they have to notify the merchants 30 days in advance. And if it's a complete termination, they have to provide some reasons. For instance, who has complained? What is the background? Why do they consider that uh, as being not in compliance with Amazon's own guidelines? So they had to create some transparency. And finally, there well, were some issues regarding the jurisdiction. Previously, if you wanted to sue Amazon because you felt unfairly treated, even if you do a lot of business through Amazon in, in Germany, you had to go to a Luxembourg court and apply Luxembourg law, which I think uh, to many small merchants is basically a, a killer because you, you wouldn't even consider moving to Luxembourg to, to sue um, a, a very important business custom. So now it's still Luxembourg law that applies, but at least you don't have to go to courts in Luxembourg. While some applauded this uh, settlement and thought, wow, eight months, that's great. Um, reality is the majority of those commitments that Amazon voluntarily agreed to were basically just the implementation, the previous implementation of what would come next July 2020 anyway, because we've got a new European platform to business regulation. I think it was touched upon early on today by Werner Streng, who was in charge of that. And that contains very precise obligations on platforms regarding transparency and notifications when they want to close accounts and so on and so forth. So basically, Amazon just looked at that and realized, well, we have to do that next year anyway, so what's the harm in accepting it now? We can sell that as a great commitment to the Bundeskartellamt, and the Bundeskartellamt can sell it as a victory uh, of its own in the global rivalry of enforcement agencies. So it was a win-win situation, and they kind of made the deal, but I think it was a deal to the detriment of the merchants because they didn't really get anything out of it. So the settlement is more of a hype than a great victory and the, the core aspect remains. And I think one of the core aspects that really needs to be solved is this obvious conflict of interest that you have if you sell your own goods, but at the same time you operate the market-leading marketplace where your rivals try to sell your goods. It's very apparent that then you will try to use that marketplace to promote your own products and push out those competitors that you don't like. And as long as this conflict of interest isn't really solved, we, we will see the marketplace and Amazon grow and others just continue to suffer. Is competition law the right tool? That can be doubted, but I think we can touch upon that in greater detail later on. I think by now Amazon's marketplace has just such a huge impact on the industry and on the economy overall that probably an ex post enforcement of particular individual cases through competition authorities is simply too little, too late. Uh, we need a broader, more powerful approach to deal with these day-to-day -day challenges of, of so many uh, affected companies. Thank you, Thomas. And with that um, final statement, I feel we also can merge transition already to the solutions and how we can change this. And what I understood from you is that you feel that competition law can be an important tool for sure, but it's probably not enough to address these uh, these very well, manifest conflicts of interest that exist. 
Uh, I also understood that uh, you're a little bit skeptical about uh, the settlement and about the B2, the business to platform uh, regulation that the Commission, uh, that the EU came up with earlier. I think we can say that because I think Werner Stenger is no longer here. But I, it, but I kind of agree because I have the impression what happened is that we create transparency but doesn't change anything about fundamental power imbalances. So what changes is that now you know you're being screwed but you're still not able to change it. So I think, I think that's... Uh, <laughs> That's to summarize very quickly. Um, but well, let, let's, let's, let's talk about solutions. Because if you look at um, like rules, like something wider um, uh, to, to regulate Amazon's uh, behavior and to kind of solve the, the, the conflict of interest, should we look at uh, some kind of public utility style regulation that, for example, um, perhaps, hopefully, upcoming future uh, president of the US, Warren, uh, proposed, Elizabeth Warren? Like she suggested we should regulate platforms as like public utilities. Is that is that something that um, that, that points in the, in the right direction? Uh, Stacey, perhaps yes. Yeah. yeah, it's been really interesting how much the issue of, of tech power and Amazon monopoly has been in the US presidential campaign. Um, I think really encouraging. And Elizabeth Warren um, really said uh, set the terms for that debate by making this, this proposal. I mean, she has called for the idea that if you operate a platform, you can't also compete on that platform, which I think is the, is, you know, the fundamental solution to Amazon. Yes, we do need a, a, a non-discrimination standard, something that says that if you are infrastructure, if you are a platform, you have obligations, uh, some sort of common carrier, utility, essential infrastructure, set of rules that say if you are that, you have a, have a different role in the economy and therefore you have to treat all comers equally, um, you have to operate within a certain set of, of rules because other companies are dependent on you. We need that for sure. My concern is that if we only do that, um, that the overwhelming incentive for Amazon to continue to game the system, to game its own platform for its own benefit, given the uh, 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 data, the lack of transparency, the difficulty in knowing exactly how algorithms work and so on, just the overwhelming incentive that the company has to manipulate things in its own favor, I do think that we need to break Amazon up and that the, the line of difference has to be between uh, yes, you could, if you're a platform, you, you can not also be offering your own goods. You can't be a retailer uh, of goods on that platform. Those things have to be separate. And I think we can begin to look at that same principle with regard to the cloud. You know, Amazon, um, Amazon's web services, you know, if you're a software developer, uh, you know, increasingly those, those firms are developing software to operate in the cloud, and those firms are very much dependent on Amazon. We see Amazon behaving in the same way. It will copy uh, the software of these companies, uh, implement it, its own versions, uh, and otherwise manipulate the system. So again, there, I think if you're a platform, are you also competing with the companies that are dependent on that, on that platform? Uh, so that's the conversation that's moving. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, that, that, you know, that that sort of fundamental structural separation is really critical. Hard line, I love it. Um, Thomas, you have something to add? Or? Yeah, I think one of the things, um, and this is a much softer approach in terms of, not, it's not legislative, but I do think that consumers, the tide is turning in the consumer market. I mean, I think that the whole ethical shopping and the, the, chain, the generational shift that we're seeing in, in people's attitudes to how they want to shop. I mean, we know that Gen Z, as we're supposed to call them, they want, they're seeking value, uh, moral and ethical value in, in the people that they're buying from. So I do think that we can take advantage of that, and we, we, we believe if you believe it and you live it, you can you can you can certainly start to orchestrate and um, facilitate that. But I do think that should be part of, of what we do, as as well as um, continually lobbying governments for legislative and regulatory change. Um, you asked particularly about platform regulation, and you said that you know you think there's a slightly stronger need for that than in the in Europe. In the US, that was a traditional approach. If you have um, a dominance that is not just short term, but permanent, and they give constant issues with a high you know, level of transactions, then you shift towards regulation, because you understand that competition authorities are not designed for these day-to-day -day 
dealings. So I think in the US it would be a very consistent approach to that. And in Europe as well, the, we've seen in the past when it comes to network industries, first we applied competition law, but then more and more sector-specific regulation came in, access obligations in the telecoms world, access obligations in railway um, line um, industry and, and laws for energy and gas providers that have to open up their networks. We've got the same conflict of interest. We've got an infrastructure through which you run your own service and you need to ensure that this infrastructure is used to basically provide certain advantage um, when you provide these services that go through the infrastructure. And the concept lends itself for something like Amazon as well for several reasons. First of all, Amazon is not here for a short period of time. They are here for the long run. And secondly, the power they are having is not just relying on some strong website. The underlying infrastructure that they are having, starting from huge telecoms and server capacities, telecom network server capacities, cloud capacities, through <coughs> logistics networks and all these things, they give that company an infrastructure that is more powerful than, than many, if not most, of the traditionally regulated entities. If you think of some local electricity provider that is subject, or a postal service provider that is subject to strict regulation, and if you compare those with Amazon, you know, they are two different types of companies. And, and if the one is regulated, why is not the other? And the next aspect is, in Germany, we talk about services of general interest that are usually subject to specific regulation. So these are services that basically consumers find quite difficult to live without. And when it comes to buying products, okay, you can say, well, just go into the shop. But by now, people got so accustomed to buy products via their online services that it's difficult to tell them, well, just buy somewhere else. And so this service is, is so much relevance to our society that I think sector-specific regulation um, will be the only solution in the medium to long Because I'm not an expert, so uh, <coughs> just to clarify, so you would say sector-specific regulation, so access rules, so they can't use people on the network when it's essential service, essentially. Uh, but I also know that in specific sectors in Europe, uh, energy, the Commission always pushed for structural separation. So that they would like to have, you know, the company owning the infrastructure being completely separate from the company offering you know, a specific service. That's something you don't think is a good idea? or uh, If you look at the existing legislation and regulated networks, you will see a high degree of different unbundling regimes. Some start with pure accounting separation, where they have, they have separate accounts. Next level would be there is a need of separate entities, but you can still be under the same holding. And then the highest level would be a property, the rest uh, of the bundling, where basically it needs to be in two separate entities. And somewhere in between, you can then place Amazon. Typically, the approach is the more, to, the stronger the infrastructure, the stricter the unbundling regime, and the less dynamics and efficiency comes from combining both. Well, in telecoms law, we know that to provide a powerful good service, you kind of need to deal with the providers of the infrastructure. They have to go hand in hand, because quite often only the infrastructure enables these new innovative services. So if you have a clear cut, this may actually you know, reduce the potential inno innovation that you can have from integrating infrastructure with services. I see quite similar, some similarities here, because we are still dealing with an internet company that should be allowed in everyone's interest to be innovative and therefore to have a clear separation to say you may not at all have any own products or something, may, may actually reduce some efficiencies that are in there. But Telecom's world has shown that is what they've called um, the functional separation, basically where you don't oblige the company to comple completely unbundle, have two different completely independent entities, but ensure that the infrastructure is functionally separated and has no structural influence on the other services may be sufficient, 
but doesn't kill off all the um, potential for innovation. And I think something along those lines would be more promising, so somewhere in between the pure accounting separation and the fully fledged ownership <coughs> unbundling uh, would more mirror uh, the realities of these. Uh, 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 Sorry. Is that often we talk about products that you know we can look at from a from a market perspective as efficiency, but for example when we talk about books, it's also about a little bit more. So it's always difficult to kind of square those values, you know, because the debate is in a way broader. Um, but but I felt you had you don't you're not on the same line, right? Yeah, I mean I don't see a lot of efficiency that's gained between Amazon being infrastructure and Amazon being retailer of goods. I don't think the connection there generates a lot of benefit. I think it generates a lot of conflict of interest. Um, it's quite problematic long term for innovation, for prices, uh, for all of those things. Um, I think fundamentally that conflict of interest has to be addressed in a fundamental way. I think it's very difficult to imagine setting up a non-discrimination oversight regime that um, they can actually police the marketplace effectively, given the huge number of sellers, the huge number of transactions, uh, the difficulty, the, the, the subtle ways in which data and algorithms can be manipulated by Amazon. Um, I think what would be required to oversee that in terms of a regulatory structure would be quite extensive. Um, and the, the simpler and cleaner and more beneficial approach is to actually make that separation. So Amazon as a platform is one company, and Amazon is a retailer and maker of goods is a separate company. And once you have the platform separated, we still need um, rules around access, rules around transparency, uh, uh, rules that prevent the platform, for example, you know, uh, keeping the revenue of sellers for an indefinite period of time, which Amazon does now. And there are all sorts of rules that need to need to happen. But at that point, you're not fighting such an uphill battle uh, and being able to over oversee those things as you are when, when the two companies are, are combined. And one of the other things I wanted to just respond to, um, if, I, if I can, or... Yeah, that's a very short Yeah, that's a short Okay. Uh, then I give Meryl a last final statement. Uh, when we talk about efficiency, um, do, you, do you see if, say, Amazon will be regulated in a way that they don't compete with you directly on sales of books, uh, do you see them as a potential ally, so that they would provide the infrastructure and uh, you know help you do logistics and distribution better? So, would that enable you, like some different type of rules, would that enable you to um, to actually do things uh, better in in, in, in cooperation? It's like an unrecognizable world, uh, we, but um, I think one of the issues is that this aggregated. Um, behemoth that Amazon is, is it's, it makes it very hard for one entity to supervise it, right? I and mean, that's one of the challenges. It's because they are so multifarious, you cannot... Governments are struggling to do because they're bigger than small countries. Excuse me, are. And um, I think that's hugely challenging. I don't... I mean, I mean the, the antipathy to Amazon in the UK, and uh, uh, the bookselling industry across the world, is pretty deeply rooted. Having said that, a lot of um, books are used to... Uh, well, they were sort of forced. They felt forced to buy their books from Amazon because they could not buy them from their suppliers. Uh, uh, it was cheaper to buy them from Amazon than it was to buy them from their own suppliers, which is a crazy situation. I mean, that's just completely distorting the market. Okay, so not that hopeful. Uh, on that note, I would like to uh, open up the floor to questions. Um, just to quickly uh, clarify a question, answer a question mark. So please note the statements. Uh, the speakers all came from abroad, so let's benefit from their time and, uh, and their knowledge. So, um, on that note, final thing also, please introduce yourself before you uh, ask a question. Um, uh, the lady here. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Marita Wiedertale from Oxfam Deutschland. Uh, Mitglied der Initiative Konzernmacht beschenken, die in Deutschland Anfang 2018 gegründet wurde. Ich habe drei Fragen. Im Moment haben wir die Novellierung des deutschen Kartellrechts, an Herrn Höppner vielleicht. 
Da gibt es einen neuen Artikel 19a, der vorsieht, dass das Bundeskartellamt spezifisch für Unternehmen, die eine überragende, marktvergreifende Bedeutung haben, eine Verfügung erlassen kann und dann äh, entsprechende Misstatbestände wie Selbstbevorzugung, äh, Erstellung der Datenportabilität etc. Äh, äh, untersagen kann. Wie schätzen Sie diese Neuerung ein? Das wäre die erste Frage. Äh, die zweite ist, dass wir im deutsch-französisch-polnischen Vorschlag äh, letztendlich für den Digitalsektor die Forderung nach Entflechtung haben. Frau Westhager hat beim Hearing im Europaparlament gesagt, dafür braucht es keine neue rechtliche Grundlage. Das könnte sie machen, aber sie will nicht. Da würde mich nochmal Ihre rechtliche Einschätzung also interessieren, ob es nicht doch noch sinnvoll ist, sozusagen die Rechtsgrundlagen noch zu verstärken. Und der dritte Punkt in Richtung strukturelle Trennung, das ist auch etwas, was wir von Seiten der Initiative Konzern macht Beschenken unterstützen. Meine Frage ist, wie Sie die indische Gesetzgebung an dieser Stelle bewerten, wo es ja, diese strukturelle Trennung gibt, zwar in protektionistischer Manier, was zu, äh, zu kritisieren ist, aber äh, vielleicht noch ein Wort dazu. Vielen Dank. Okay, so a very specific, uh, very welcome questions, thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, the survey in the back. Thank you. Um, Tim Noonan, International Trade Union Confederation. Um, it would seem that uh, Amazon is subsidizing financially its loss-making or very low-profit retail operations from its highly profitable web services. Um, is that an issue for competition law? Thank you. Uh, we take a last question, take one last question. You'll get the microphone from behind you. Yeah. I'm Dr. from the Federation of European Publisher. Uh, if you just allow me, one comment is that publishers do care, and in many European countries they have fought with booksellers on fixed book prices, as it was mentioned before, to allow to keep a vast network of, of uh, booksellers. But I was wondering whether you thought that uh, working on the inter interoperability so that uh, if you have bought a Kindle, you can still buy from other retailers uh, uh, your books and you don't have to buy uh, systematically from Amazon. And maybe also whether we could start with interoperability in public procurement so that when school buy uh, educational content uh, and it is tied to a company that it, it they have to have interoperable format. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my memory is like a grated cheese, so let's, let's uh, start with the last question first, if I still remember. Um, interoperability for ebooks. Sure. No, I do appreciate publishers are incredibly supportive often of booksellers. I'm not being critical of the publishing community, I and mean, they are under enormous pressure from. Amazon because they are, you know, it's very hard for them to complain about their biggest retailer and um, you've got the, you know, the monopsony, you've got the opposite of the monopoly, so, um, and there's an awful lot of collaboration goes on in the UK between booksellers and publishers, so absolutely. Um, the interoperability thing, for those of you who don't know, that's about um, Kindle being un functionally unusable by other, uh, you, ca you can't buy ebooks from someone else and then use them on your Kindle and vice versa. Or not vice versa so much, but um, and it's been a it's been a big issue. I mean, what well, I think in practical terms, from a UK point of view, um, the ebook market is so far gone from um, high street traditional booksellers that um, it's it's an argument we're not really having anymore. But I think in principle, certainly for pro for public procurement and for school supply, it should, it's a battle we should continue to fight, and they should be forced to allow people to buy their books, the ebooks from any. Um, source and then use your pencil to read them. I mean, I think it's a, that's a, that's a given. I would I would support that. But um, the e as I say, the ebook market has has gone from our from our membership. Yes, that's right. Um, Thomas, what's the specific question? Uh, firstly, to touch upon the interoperability, I think this is a traditional tool to basically prevent this walled garden issue that basically they build their own ecosystem and users can't get out. They can't, what the economists would call multi-home, 
basically using different providers for the same service and we know now that this ability to multi-home use different players is very crucial to prevent the concentration to, of a market towards a monopoly. So I think these interoperability obligations are a very important tool to prevent monopolization and um, in Germany we've seen uh, some commitment decision in 2013 that deals with that and 2017 with all the books as well that deals with that. So that's on the agenda and it's a fight that is worth fighting. Can I start with the last question and then we'll go back to the first regarding <coughs> cross subsidies. Cross subsidies are not under EU and also not national competition law per se legal. Why? Because under general corporate law, um, holding is always entitled to subsidize its subsidiaries by giving more money to the one and then other, another entity gets less. So you would get a very strong conflict with the doctrine of corporate law that what you do inside your holding is totally up to you and your management and shouldn't be subject to external scrutiny. That you know, makes it also more difficult to for instance, deal with issues of self-favoring because the threshold between the allowed subsidy and the disallowed um, self-favoring um, is more of a technical aspect. But in general, these subsidies are not seen as an abuse of dominance. Now to the first question, hmm, the first question for those that didn't uh, translate uh, the German question, so it was about a new reform in Germany, the 10th Amendment of the Competition Law Act, and there's a specific new innovative rule that deals with the power of companies with an paramount cross-market relevance, a term that has been newly defined, basically companies that are not just dominant, but actually have a strong foothold in several markets and can act as a kind of gatekeeper and use this dominance in one intermediation market to also get their way into other markets. And the idea behind this concept is that you put additional obligations on these companies because they have a stronger impact on the economy than just dominant companies. And what the question was, was that one of those specific obligations that can now be imposed on those <coughs> suffices, which is that they may not favor their own services whenever they provide their intermediation services, so that would mean an Amazon marketplace may not favor its own products uh, when it, uh, let's say, shows search results. Um, we have to distinguish two aspects here to answer your question. The overall concept is very convincing additional rules for those that have particular strong market power and can use it to really influence entire industries. Unfortunately, the current proposal has one conceptual fault, um, and the fault is that these obligations only come into effect once the authority has issued a decision that identifies a company as being one of those companies and then imposes that obligation. And it turns out, if you look at it more closely, and <coughs> I may be allowed to say that an article of that will appear next week. Um, if you look at it more closely, the problem is, uh, and I can send that to you and they can have it in very much detail, that to do that, the authority will really have to wait until it's almost too late. They will have to wait until someone has already favored its own services and then they can only specify, ah, here is a problem, okay, that's what they've done wrong. So the whole idea of we impose this obligation ex ante before something happens will not happen in reality. So this law as a concept is correct, but there is some structural flaw in it that needs to be amended. So if you submit any comments on that, you should pick that up and say, look, it needs to be a general ban of these self-favoring conducts, and this ban needs to be per se, per statute, and not be dependent on an authority imposing it first. So last question, or rather there was one with an Indian um, relevance. I, I, I'm afraid I'm not into the Indian laws that uh, would allow me to touch upon that. But the, the second aspect was um, behavioral remedies and Mrs. Tyre's comments on that. Um, we have to distinguish here between what you can impose per legislation ex ante, so basically irrespective of any 
that the use of conduct, they basically say, we think this company is so powerful that even if it hasn't done anything wrong so far, we require it to separate these two units. That is something that we've seen in energy uh, or, or railway industries, um, where we've got a clear legislation saying, you know, you can't operate both units, the infrastructure and the services. That is a different question from what can a competition authority do once it has identified a particular abuse of dominance to bring that abuse to an end. And there, Ms. Vestaya said that already now she's got the power to impose as a remedy either behavioral or structural obligations, and the structural obligations would be if it turns out, let's say, a pure non-discrimination obligation is not sufficient, we could, in theory, then impose a structural obligation, say you need to separate these two units. But in reality, that hasn't really been used for a very long time because the authorities always tend to try behavioral remedies first, and only as a last resort, they will turn to structural remedies. So to answer your questions, is it still worth considering strict um, obligations in this respect? I think yes, but again, we would need to really look at the different markets very closely to identify those infrastructure elements that you can easily cut out without collapsing the whole ecosystem and making it just less efficient but not helping anyone really in, in the cost. I actually wanted to just touch on the issue of predatory pricing, um, this, this issue of Amazon selling goods at a loss in order to take market share. This is something Amazon has done consistently from the from the very beginning. Um, and you know, predatory pricing, it's a good example of, of how antitrust law in the U.S. has just been uh, turned on its head. Um, you know, we used to uh, enforce, we have laws against predatory pricing, we no longer enforce them, we no longer interpret them in the same way, and the result is that predatory pricing is essentially illegal at this point. Uh, and Amazon has used that to its great advantage. So in the first six years that Amazon was in business, it lost $3 billion, uh, mostly selling books at a loss in order to take market share from competing booksellers that just didn't have the financial wherewithal to match those, those losses. Uh, we, by doing that, what we essentially al allow is that companies can win simply by being bigger and simply by being better connected to Wall Street, right? Wall Street has rewarded that strategy amply. Um, and this continues. In the 2000s, when Amazon faced really uh, upstart competitors online that were really giving it, it a run for its money in certain sectors, like Zappos, the shoe retailer, what did it do? It sold shoes at a loss until Zappos, leading Red Ink, agreed to sell itself to Amazon, and today Zappos is, is owned by Amazon. Uh, even now, Amazon has recently launched a, um, uh, they're, they're moving into one day delivery, overnight delivery. And the average order size for overnight delivery is $8. And it costs Amazon over ten dollars just to ship it, just to ship it. Meaning it, it is losing substantially on every single overnight uh, order that it takes. Uh, if you're a competing retailer in any sector, how can you do that? How can you sustain some of losses? This is a strategy for, for market dominance, and yet we do not police that kind of behavior. I think one of the most um, kind of weirdly, um, uh, you know, through the looking glass kinds of moments uh, about, about how antitrust has gone wrong was a number of years ago when a, a group of book publishers got together and said, we're going to change this deal. We don't want Amazon to be able to continue to uh, underprice books. And so we're going to change the way that we contract with Amazon. We're going to say, you get a commission. We set the price, you get a commission. Um, and what happened? We had the Department of Justice, our competition authority, step in and go after the publishers uh, for COVID uh, to, to, to address prices. And what was so amazing about that moment is that that set of publishers together, all together, has less market power. They control a smaller share of the books that are sold in the US than Amazon. Now Amazon can go have an internal meeting and decide whatever it wants to do about its own prices and represent more market power in the room 
And yet, where is the Department of Justice on that? Where are the antitrust authorities uh, on that issue of power? And it's just a, a sort of crystal example of how we have turned everything upside down. The good news is that there's growing kind of recognition of this, uh, I think, uh, in a lot of places around the world, certainly in the US. Um, the public, it, the word monopoly has come back into our discourse. It's a, it's a word you see in newspapers. Um, and monopoly, of course, is the people's word. You know, antitrust is, is, a, is a technical affair for lawyers and economists, but monopoly is something everyone understands. And people are at the gate saying, this has gone wrong. We have, uh, we have taken our eye off of a really critical part of public policy, a, a part of public policy that distributes power, that deals with the question of, of concentrated power, which is absolutely critical to fairness, to equality, to everyone having um, a, a reasonable return on their, on their labor. Uh, so this is a, you know, I, I think one of the things that we're seeing as, as people uh, uh, reinvigorate this is that we have to reorganize antitrust policy around a different set of values. We have to be looking at this differently. We have to go back to um, not just talking about narrow issues of efficiency, but rather talking about structure, about, about issues of power more fundamentally. Um, and that, to me, is a really encouraging turn, and that's only happened in the last few years. Thank you, Paolo Fulpi. Um, Nick, do we still have time for a round of questions, or? Uh, I think that that's a good point for a place to end. So. <coughs> okay, well, uh, on that note, well, I think I would really like to thank the panelists. I also think that uh, there is actually quite quite some agreement that we should move forward. We should come up with some rules, so it can't just be individual policing of companies. We should really come up with some proactive uh, regulation of the sectors concerned. Uh, and I think this is really an excellent time to advocate for that because we just have the commission uh, starting well right now. So this could be an a very opportune moment to influence the policy agenda and advocate for those solutions. Thanks a lot for the balance and a warm round of applause.